Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of SES CyberTalk. I'm Ritwik Gupta, your host. I'm a machine learning research scientist here at the Emerging Technology Center. And with me, I have Justice and Jason. Hi, how's it going? Good. What's up? So we're here to talk today about quantum computing. Um, and quantum computing, you know, I, I've heard a lot of buzz about it, and I'm sure everyone, everyone else has too. Um, and I know you guys are working on a project that's related to quantum computing. So I guess let me start with the first question. What is quantum computing? Right, so quantum computing is a new architecture for computing uh, that's being developed. And the idea is that we're switching out classical bits for quantum bits. And then the question is, what's a quantum bit? And a quantum bit is a very similar to a classical bit, but it uses quantum mechanics to have an infinite number of states. And then once you measure it, it collapses down into either a zero one, just like uh, in classical bits. But this explosion into infinite states gives us a couple of different unique properties that we can leverage. So when, when you say observe it, like you mean like, you know, I, I have like a chip and I look at it and it collapses or what's going on there? Yeah, that's that was exactly what's happening. I mean, there's different ways of measuring uh, a quantum bit and, and observing it. But when a quantum mechanical system is working and you're not observing it, it can be in many different states at once. But sure. then once you actually do uh, look at it and measure it using different types of techniques, it does collapse into one or the other state. Gotcha. And so, so measurement is, is more of an abstract thing that's not necessarily like you someone physically looking at it, but it could be any way of kind of probing the state of this qubit. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, uh -huh. I see. And, and so, so, so why, why, why bother? Like, why, we have great computers already. Like, I can go play Crisis at full, res full resolution. Like, why should I bother with quantum computing? Yeah, so there's kind of two main... Well, the main reason totally would be that it gives us speed up in certain situations. Uh, not every algorithm will see a speed up uh, when you convert from classical to quantum computers, uh, but there are several ones. Uh, so, for instance, prime factorization is yeah. one where we'll see... A, potentially an exponential speed up, uh, and it has severe implications on uh, cryptography. Gotcha. Um, and then the other one is also the amount of space certain algorithms take up. Okay. So there are certain types of quantum finite automata that uh, take up far fewer bits or qubits than they, their classical uh, computer architectures uh, require. I see. So, so basically what we're saying is uh, and tell me if I can get this wrong, right? Is, is for some types of algorithms, and there's some sorts of problems, um, depending on kind of the structure of the problem, quantum computers could give me not only speed up in terms of time, but also the space complexity that, that, that a classical algorithm would take up compared to a quantum computer. Yeah, that's that right? exactly right. Okay. Yes. And so, so I'm also assuming that you have to create special quantum algorithms that do this too, right? It's not just, I can't just take, for example, I don't know, Dijkstra's and just run it on a quantum computer. Yeah, while for every quantum, uh, sorry, for every classical computation, there is a quantum analog. Uh, that quantum analog is not necessarily faster and oftentimes it can be a little slower. But for specific quantum algorithms that we create that you cannot perform on a classical computer, uh, you will see these speed ups. I see. And there is a bit of a merger as to uh, which quantum algorithms might be replicable on a classical computer. And so it's actually furthering our understanding of classical computers also. I see. Well, that's, that seems pretty intuitive to me. Um, mm -hmm. Jason, why don't you tell me a little bit, I, I mean, I, I know you guys are working on some quantum computing stuff. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you're doing and kind of uh, some of the core pieces that we should, we should know about? Okay. Yeah, so um, our project is focused on applying quantum computing to software verification and validation. Uh, more specifically on combinatorial optimization for MP complete or MP hard problems. Um, so we're trying to leverage the kind of things that uh, Justice was talking about to attack that problem. Uh, combinatorial optimization actually is found in many different applications, machine learning and, um, and, and obviously for software verification and validation. Um, so that's what we're working on right now and we're um, also trying to figure out if uh, near-term quantum computers uh, which are so-called the noisy intermediate scale, scale quantum computers, which have a small number of qubits and are noisy, so there's high error rates. If we could actually leverage these quantum computers um, before we have proper quantum uh, error correction, which is what you would need to run Shor's algorithm, for example. I see, and so Shor's is the one that does prime factorization, correct? Yeah. yeah. So basically, are you, are you telling me that near-term quantum computing and long-term quantum computing, like they present fundamentally different challenges or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so if you think about uh, Shor's algorithm, um, you know, you want to break 2048 RSA, you need that many logical qubits, but you actually need like an order of magnitude more uh, error correction qubits. 
Um, so, so we're we're really far away from having that number of qubits. So you say error correction a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've never heard of error correction. Error correction, at least in our in our classical CPUs or anything. What's so, the deal? So so we actually do have uh, error correction in classical CPUs. You can implement an error correction scheme where you let's say have an operational qubit, and then you have several redundant qubits to serve as error correction, but. Error correction is not so critical with classical computers. We kind of have that under control. Maybe if you're in some environment which needs it uh, more, you'll have it. Um, but in quantum computers, um, we have lots of sources of errors uh, that affect qubits. So interaction of qubits with each other, with the environment. Um, and this means that we have high error rates, at least right now. Um, and error correction uh, utilizes extra qubits in redundancy to perform this error correction. Um, and there are schemes that, that eliminate it. Essentially, they can push the error rates down so far that you can do a computation for sort of an extended period of time, minutes, hours, et cetera. I see. And so basically, I, I, I guess what you're saying is that the reason why this is very relevant for near-term quantum computing is that as we have really noisy chips and noisy quantum computing, um, are, are you saying that we can't do all these fancy things that people have been promising us, like 2048-bit RSA uh, you know, breaking? Mm -hmm. um, Yep. Because we're limited by the amount of error correcting qubits we have. Yep, yeah. I see. Uh, that, that's not the only uh, factor, but that's one of the major ones. I see. Um, yep. Okay, so that's. I mean, that's that's interesting because I always thought that you know now that we have a quantum computer, right? Like, and a lot of companies do. I just thought that oh, we can do all this stuff now, but I guess mm. that's not true. No. So, um, so what can we do with near-term quantum computers then? Yeah. So uh, right now. There isn't a whole, well, there, we're starting to get bigger. As, as our quantum computers are starting to push up towards 50 qubits and 100 qubits, uh, we're exponentially increasing what we can actually model and what we can do. And one of the really low hanging fruits right now uh, is molecular simulation. Okay. Uh, so and you mean like, like chemical molecules, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so uh, we can accurately represent these, uh, these, these molecules. Uh, we can see all the different states, and there's a couple of different simulations you can run off of that. And as you start getting into only slightly larger molecules, such as maybe caffeine, it becomes extremely difficult for a classical computer, even a supercomputer, to accurately represent these molecules. But as we start getting uh, just maybe a couple hundred more qubits, uh, this should definitely be accessible. Um, again, it, it's, it's about the logical qubits versus the qubits needed for error correction. Um, so actually, you know, that, that brings me to another point is, is I always hear about these things that, oh, you know, Google or someone has created a, cube, a chip that has 72 qubits or something like that. Mm -hmm. When they say that, are they saying that there's 72 qubits that do actual computation? Or is that, does that include the amount of error correction qubits that they need? Or is it, so, what's the deal there? So I think the Bristol cone of the 72 qubits, there are some number which are there for error correction. Um, so I think the Bristol cone has error correction qubits built in. Okay. Most other companies are after using all qubits for logical qubits, and they're more interested in finding algorithms which are able to tolerate the noise. That is, use all qubits for logical and figure out some other way of, of, of dealing with the noise. So, so okay, let, let's say I have a quantum chip, mm -hmm. right? I can do some quantum computation mm -hmm. on it. Where do I start? How do I write an algorithm? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you have to, you have to go back, uh, like Justice was saying about um, designing quantum algorithms, which do some computation, which has a classical analog. Um, and then you have to, uh, so there's a software stack in quantum computing, much like um, early days of integrated circuit uh, computing. And that stack is not well developed yet. Um, so you've got to, most people have to f start the application layer and take that problem all the way down to bare metal, so to speak. Uh, and that process is very difficult right now. Uh, so there's a lot of development going into exactly how you do that and how you do it optimally. Um, so when you're programming a quantum computer, there's sort of a limited amount of programmability at an application layer that would be accessible for data scientists and engineers. Um, but to really utilize them now, you have to be sort of a domain expert. And okay. that has to change. Yeah, they're, they're definitely working towards changing that right now. Because uh, as Jason was saying, every single quantum computer, even uh, within the same companies that are creating multiple quantum computer chips, uh, have completely different architectures. There's different connectivity between each of the qubits, and this really matters uh, on how you, what kind of computations you can have and the efficiency of them. Uh, and each, uh, basically, company that that creates a uh, a quantum computer and then makes it accessible to the public, um, they will abstract away that compiler, transpiler from normally Python. There, there are other programming languages that they'll use, but it's normally Python. They'll abstract away a transpiler that takes Python code down into 
a, uh, a format that they can actually run on their, uh, their quantum computers, which is normally uh, accessible th via the cloud. So, so are you telling me that I could today, you know, you know, launch my, my cloud editor or whatever, um, and just kind of like write a program, like I could just use for loops and everything, or, or, is, there, or is, there like a, is there like a specific way I have to write a program? Like I've heard of things like quantum circuits and adiabatic, mm -hmm. all these things I've heard, like with, can I just write a program is what I'm asking? I mean, sure you could, yeah. but you'd have to understand the way quantum circuits work. And okay. um, so I guess we could say that the abstraction layer, which is above quantum circuits uh, at the application layer, there's a, a limited number of applications which are accessible by data scientists and engineers. Okay. If you actually want to program a quantum computer, you have to understand at the circuit level, and that means understanding at the quantum computation level. So um, is, is it fair for me to say that if I were to bring quantum computing to an, an analogous classical setting, hmm. and if I as a data scientist wanted to use that, I would basically be writing like Verilog for ML is that, is that an equivalent for quantum computing of where we're at now with the quantum circuit models? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on if someone has implemented the available um, quantum algorithms that you're looking at. Okay. If they haven't, then you'd have to figure out how to implement it, or you'd have to go to the literature and implement it yourself. I see. Um, yeah, the whole the whole field's in, in its infancy. Yeah, I, I would say the, the future, at least near termish, uh, should kind of see quantum computers as an alternative to a GPU, um, okay. where Instead of, if, if once you reach an algorithm that's very difficult to do in the first place on a classical computer, right now we would go and use a GPU to give us a speed up. Um, and that works for most algorithms. Uh, but then if we even have a better speed up using a quantum computer, you might call that as a subroutine and then get the information back and continue. So as, as far as I know, right, um, uh, for, for my hardware engineering background a little bit is, is GPUs are this SIMD architecture, which are really good for matrix operations? Are you saying that quantum computers can do matrix operations really well, or just like, are you just using like an analogy that GPUs provide speed up for certain tasks, and quantum computers can also serve as this kind of coprocessor, basically? Yep. Accelerator. Yes. Co Accelerator. That's okay. Accelerator. That's a good way of looking at so it. Yes. So, will I be, so are you basically saying that I will never have a quantum computer? It's just kind of, like I can't just log into a quantum computer, right? Like it's going to be like a chip that's kind of sitting on the side that I can use. Um, so what, do you, what, what, what would you mean by logging into the quantum computer? Like it's not like I could just like you know come into work and log in on Active Directory and a Windows oh, is running on a quantum computer. Uh, like it's more like a th it's, thing it's, that it's like a coprocessor and accelerator, yes. and you would uh, submit a job to that QPU. Gotcha. Um, it, would, okay. it would it would it would compute. It would send back the result, and you could read that in you know on a server that's connected to it. I see. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so long term, you know, what are the goals, right? So, like, I understand near term, everything's noisy. I understand that there's some constraints with, like, we have to keep it near, like, absolute zero or, like, you know, mm -hmm. really low temperatures. What's, what are the long term goals for quantum computing? Well, the, the, the one definite long term goal is to get enough qubits and uh, enough uh, physical qubits so that you can run error correction, um, pushing the coherence times to longer time periods to be able to run larger problems to do, execute Shor's algorithm, for example. Um, and the, the sort of timeline that most people feel for that to happen is about 10 years, maybe 10 to 20 10 years. years. Okay. Um, so beyond that, I think, I mean, there's a number of alternative um, quantum computing architectures like topological quantum computing that Microsoft is working on. Um, there are other models. That there's a whole bunch of stuff in the academic literature that's coming up. So it, it's a lot like in the 1950s when nobody knew that the transistor was going to emerge as the dominant me medium of computation. Uh, so I think it's a lot like that. So um, it's hard to say what's going to happen in 10, 20 plus years. But I think everybody is, is aiming at being able to execute Shores. Um, that's the one thing for sure everyone's aiming for. Okay. Uh, sure. For mm -hmm. sure. For sure. Um, and so, uh, I mean, this is, this is, again, very interesting. And I can't say I understand all of it, but if I wanted to go and learn more about that, do you guys have any resources for the audience to uh, go read up on this stuff? Yeah, so we're starting to compile on our own Quantum Hub, um, which we'll link the link to that. We're starting to compile a corpus of materials that you can look at. It'll include uh, academic papers, it'll include YouTube videos and uh, books and anything else that we find helpful, maybe tu some tutorials to get you started. Um, I definitely suggest a great way to get an intro is uh, to follow some of the uh, main academics in the area. Uh, especially uh, Seth Lloyd has some interesting stuff on YouTube along with Ryan O'Donnell. Cool. Jason, any resources for you? or? Uh, oh, resources. Oh, geez. There's a whole bunch. Scott Aronson, Seth Lloyd, John Preskill at Caltech. Um, 
I forget the guy's name at UC Santa Barbara. He works at Google. Eddie Farhi from MIT was also at Google Eddie now. Farhi, I could keep going on. Okay. It's better to put a list. Yeah, we can, so so Quantum Hub is what I heard. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you guys host. So we'll, we'll put a link to that in the description and, and, and on the screen as well. Um, and then all these academic papers, which we can link to as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, exactly. That's really helpful. Again, guys, uh, if you guys want more information on the work that we're doing, um, uh, you, we'll again link them in the description. Uh, if you guys have any specific questions that we can answer, um, please you know, just email us at info at um, But Jason, Justice, thank you guys so much. It's very informative, and uh, hopefully we hear back from the audience really soon. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, man.